Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thanks for joining me again, listeners. You know, I appreciate you giving me some of your time every week. I have something different, which, you know, at 300 plus episodes is not always easy to do. With me today is Dr. Terry Pease. She wrote a book called Love, Dignity, and Parkinson's. And there's enough overlap with Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. And her her information in her book was so excellent that I decided to have her come on and talk to us about her journey. So thanks for joining me, Terry. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm really happy to be here. Thanks. So one of the main reasons that I was very interested in you and your book is that you met your husband after his Parkinson's diagnosis. So that's, that's a, un- I hope that's a unique place to start. Um, okay. You could also tell us about yourself and then answer that question, whatever works for you. Well, I'll start by telling you that it's one of my favorite stories to tell because, you know, being the 21st century, I met my husband online and everything in me said, don't do this. Don't do this. It's not a smart thing to do. <laughs> and yet he was so appealing and things just clicked and we were just a great pair and so I spent a long time we chatted online for a long 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 time and then we finally met face to face and it was like okay I'm gonna do this so that's one side of it is that it was he was just we were just right for each other even though we were you know this was a late life marriage but on the other hand you know when you enter caregiving you don't know what you don't know Mm -hmm. and on the toughest day I could imagine that I might have thought well if that's gonna be that hard maybe not but The other thing I can say for sure is that there was not a moment in the many years that I was married to my husband, whose name was Peter, there was never a moment when I said, why did I do this? And so it never felt like it was the wrong thing to have done, even though it was not the easy thing to have done. That's definitely true. Well, I'm impressed that you never, you never felt like you'd made the wrong choice because there are some tough days. Oh, yeah. Awesome. I'm not saying it was always easy, but maybe it's because also I had grown up around people with disabilities and I had worked with people with disabilities and had done training for other people to work with disabilities, people with disabilities. And so it wasn't unknown territory for me to know that human beings come in all different conditions and then not all of them are perfect. None of us are perfect. (laughs) So true. That's better training for caregiving than being a photographer, which is how I ended up taking care of my mom. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you, what, so how did you bring your knowledge and, and expertise into caring for him? Because obviously you pretty much made the choice. He was the right guy and you had the, mm-hmm. you had, at least you assumed you had the knowledge to do the caregiving. Did, what, did that turn out to be basically true or did you still have to learn along the way like most of us? Oh, both. I had a tremendous amount to learn because I didn't know very much about Parkinson's at all. But, and I certainly did not know the degree to which Parkinson's dementia was common. That was absolutely not known to me when I met my husband. But because I'd worked with adults with disabilities, including traumatic brain injury and cognitive disabilities and so forth, I had learned long before I met Peter to see the human being in whatever sort of cognitive and physical condition the person was in. And that probably was the training that stayed with me the most because when a person has dementia, when a person has Alzheimer's, and I know much less about Alzheimer's than I do about Parkinson's dementia, but when a person has Parkinson's dementia, for sure, there's all the symptomatology and the difficulties and the struggle and the disagreements and all of that stuff. But then the way I think about it is that if you as a caregiver can hold yourself still, emotionally still, and I'm not sure exactly how to say this, but then I use this kind of image of sliding past the symptoms to reconnect with the person. And for me, that worked. It worked because I didn't expect him to stay the same. And I didn't feel harmed by the fact that he didn't stay the same. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. 
I like I like how you say kind of staying still in your emotions. I think that was one of the biggest struggles I had with my mom. I knew fairly well what to expect. I started the podcast. Um, basically, my pa- dad passed away June, June, March 2017, and I started the podcast at the end of 2017. I started researching and everything. Um, so I'd had almost a year of caring for my mom. She was in a memory care residence, which that's the only way the two of us would have managed the three years that she lived after him. But it was difficult because there were a lot of things that she did that she was extraordinarily critical of me as I was growing up. Like one of her favorite statements when I was a kid or teenager was, you would, you'd bitch if you were hit with a new ex. Well, yeah, I probably <laughs> would. Thank you very yeah. much. That was a very uh, enlightening statement, not. And so when she would complain and fuss and grumble and just just that unhappy she wasn't like aggressive or agitated maybe she was more agitated than I was aware of but it was just like just like a not almost a trickle of negativity there were days when it was just like it will not do any good if you throw that phrase in her face it will, but all of you if you say that to her it's just gonna make things worse so I you know but it was just constantly like the challenging part of our relationship was amplified with her Alzheimer's. And then of course, you know, when, uh, my dad died when I was 50. So there's times when it's like, you know, I'd really like to be able to talk to my mom about anything and I can't. And that was really hard. Is that, is that something that you learn to get past mm. and how? Well, <laughs> well, I mean, you don't have any choice. It's I mean, once you realize, you know, you don't have the magic wand. You're not going to go poof, Parkinson's go away. <laughs> I mean, you would have done that long ago if you could. Yep. Um, once you've gotten that under your belt and you know that that's so, then you just um, have to find your way to a place where it's not about. Oh, how do I say this? It's not about making things right it's accepting things as they are and being okay with that and that sounds so i don't know trivial sounds easy but it's not (laughs) it's it's not easy and it's it's a tremendous discipline it's an intellectual discipline it's a spiritual discipline to be a good caregiver but there's always going to be something that we have to face. And the, the myth is that, oh, everything is going to be just great because that's what I envision and that's what I imagine and what I want. And so then when it's not, how do you react to that? It's like, oh, yeah, this is reality. I just you know, read and- recently, sorry, I read recently okay. where we have a, um, one of the reasons they think that anxiety and depression is so much higher these days is because we expect that we should always be happy. You know, we should be positive and happy and yay, spring, you know, all that kind of stuff. And that's not reality. And I, when I read that, I thought that's actually a really good point because, you know, life is not always easy. There's always challenges, regardless, even if you're not a caregiver, which I don't think any of those people are listening to us today. But, you know, like I have a, my, I have two golden retrievers, one of which is not yet six and he's dying from terminal cancer and it stinks. You know, I've had six golden retrievers. He will be the third dying from cancer. You know, this is something you know when you own golden retrievers, that this is a very large problem in that breed. They're way Mm -hmm. overbred. Genetic problems lead to cancer, blah, 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 blah. You know, yes, it's sad, but I'm still, you know, it's like I can't fix him, so I'm moving on, doing the best we can for him. And then there's just challenges with marriage and friends and businesses. (laughs) It's like... You move, you know, so if you're always expecting to be happy and you you should work very hard not to be or yeah, not to be sad or not to be frustrated or angry, then you're just kind of working against typical human nature. We should kind of st- realize that well, we almost need to strive for a neutral. And I think that could help caregivers because, you know, we're always trying so hard to do such a good job with them and it feels so unappreciated because they're not able to show appreciation. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I think that I read, when I read that article, it was like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I don't strive to be super happy every day. I just strive to be content 
You know, I try mm-hmm. to do things where I can, by the end of the day, go, I, I did a good job today. You know, I'll pat myself on the shoulder. And to me, that's, that's the best way to live. I hope, I hope that's a good, uh, a good analogy or good way to live because that's, that's what I'm doing. So think, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, excuse me, but I was going to say that I think that the idea that the reality of human life is that things get, we get older we're of the nature to be sick. Um, there's always going to be suffering or distress or discomfort. And to be unsurprised by that gives us the ability to ask ourselves the important questions, which is given that this is so, what will I do? Given that my partner, my husband no longer knows who I am, what will I do? And since I don't have to be perfect, I don't have to expect my partner to be perfect, and and this is really hard for caregivers. I don't always have to fix the situation that's troubling my partner. Let me say that really carefully. Most caregivers that I've encountered want to be so good at caregiving that there's the person somehow feels so much better that it's almost like they don't have the disease that they have. And I understand that because there were many days that I just wanted to make it better for my husband. But when I was like, no, that's not in the cards. That's not off. That's not on offer to have things go back to the way they are. Then you're not searching for that. And then you don't have to demand that of yourself. You know, I think if we demand of ourselves to fix every little thing and respond to every distress and to never have our partner be angry with us or upset or even afraid. Um, we don't feel like we're failing. But That's one of true. the things that I one of the things that I try to help caregivers achieve, both in my book and in the, the online programs and so forth that I do, is to get a clear definition of what is success as a caregiver. I suspect that a lot of caregivers for people who have Parkinson's and maybe for people with dementia as well, is that perfect um, caregiver means that the person with the disorder, with the distress, is never unhappy, is never afraid, is never confused, is never, um, you know, frustrated or overwhelmed or any of these other many, many things. And in fact, you're never going to get there. So you could end every day thinking, I didn't fix it. And this is not particularly conscious, but it does undermine your sense of well-being. And your sense of well-being as a caregiver has to come from something else. That is very true. Expecting to not, them not being anxious, fearful, angry, frustrated. Those are all normal human emotions with or without Parkinson's, with or without Alzheimer's or FTD. You know, so when you say that, it's like, yeah, I'm, I don't think I did that with my mom. To, I did to a degree. My goal with my mom was to give her as much pleasure as possible, as much quality of life as possible without uh, extending dying from Alzheimer's, which that's a pretty fine tightrope to walk. But I don't think I tried to fix everything. Maybe I did. I don't know. I might have to dwell on that one. But it's it obviously is not well good for anybody because those are all normal emotions. They're just amplified when you have a disease that affects your brain. So the one thing that I really, really liked about your book was um, you have a chapter that if you take the word Parkinson's out, it applies to every caregiver. Just take the word Parkinson's out. Okay. You've rewritten the entire go. chapter. Okay. Is re- reimagining your relationship. And I know for a lot of people, in my position, like my mom thought I was her best friend. Well, okay. You know, how do you complain about that? You know, I'd rather be her best friend than that witch who drags her out to the park to watch children, which is what we did or, you know, negative feelings. And I never felt badly that she forgot what our relationship really was. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes it was a little frustrating, especially when she'd tell people I've known her forever. It's like, yeah, you think, (laughs) you know, my whole life (laughs) yeah pretty much you've known me longer than anybody else um but the one the one thing that did make it 
challenging, and I only recognize this more after now that she's been gone for three years, is because, and I knew this at the time, but it's more acute now, is because we were, quote, best friends and and the way she was with her friends, you know, they weren't huggy, kissy, hand-holdy. They weren't, you know, physical in their joy with each other. So she wasn't physical with me. And I never pushed it because she never seemed um, receptive to, you know, hugs and hand-holding and all that. And I wish I'd pushed it more. I was kind of respecting where she was at, which is what they always tell you to do. So I kind of regret that part. But um, maybe if I had read that chapter on reimagining your relationship, I might have been able to smoothly go from, well, this is what a daughter relationship is. This is what a best friend relationship is. And maybe morph it into something that worked better for both of us. Because I think she would have benefited from a little more physical affection. So how? let me read my question here. So you're advising, you're adjusting your relationship is, an, is important reading, translates to many issues of aging. So can you talk a little bit about how anyone facing such a challenging disease should approach um, adjusting their relationship? Because I think that helps a lot. When I read that, I was like, I have not read this in any book, and I've read a lot of books. So <laughs> you're on to something well, I, there. Well, thank you. I mean, I certainly didn't hear it from anyone else that. I couldn't just keep trying. And, and I think this happens with caregivers a lot, right? I think a lot of spousal caregivers and maybe other caregivers as well are trying to, it's almost like dragging somebody back into the place that's familiar and recognizable and that you've lost. But that's futile, I think. And it hurts you. And it, it also exhausts you. And it exhausts the person who has Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or whatever condition. I think. Actually, I wrote a little article about this. It's a blog posting somewhere, and I'll give you the link. But I wrote a little article about a new kind of marriage. And I drew on a style of interaction that actors use in improvisational acting called yes and, and it's the first rule in improv. And yes and is a very good way of approaching our interactions with a partner who has dementia, which is to say, Yes, you just ask me, am I your mom? And I can answer, no, I'm not your mom, but I'm here to help you. And I'll take the best care of you that I can. To do that, you've got to be completely un, not disturbed by the fact that your beloved husband doesn't know who the heck you are anymore. And that openness and acceptance of the reality of the disease, I think is a great um, help for us as caregivers. And I'd like to go back to something you said a little while ago when you were talking about your mom thinking that you were her best friend and that you didn't um, you know, maybe reach for her hand or do some of the things that you might have wanted from this person that you were being like best friends with since you were you said, yes, you think I'm your best friend and I'm here to help you. Even if you didn't say those words, you did those facts. Even if she didn't want warmth and touching, you did. Mm -hmm. And what you want counts as a caregiver. If I had to take this entire book and turn it into one sentence, it's you count too. You count too. And once you really believe that as a caregiver, I think it's going to change how you make decisions, how you set boundaries and limits, because you have to set boundaries at some point, but you can set them from a very different place as opposed to being so worn out and ragged that you have to. And you are much more able to have a real connection with the person who has dementia. I think some of the happiest memories that I have of my time with my husband were long after he was deep into his dementia when, I don't know, he was just um, enjoying what was happening in the moment. And for example, I, we were t videotaping a greeting to some the people who ran the memory care facility where he lived for the last two years of his life. And, you know, we were setting this up and I was asking him questions because what we wanted to say was, hi, thank you. This is a good place. Thank you for founding it happy birthday or whatever. Um, but once, <laughs> once I started the camera, he said the 
sort of cheekiest, funniest, most impudent thing you could imagine. And it tickled him to pieces. And this is this old guy with dementia being silly. But all of a sudden, it was two old people being silly together. And that was my joining him where he was. And being joyful about that. I mean, there was a lot of joy in my life with my husband, even as dementia galloped along and stole the guy that I'd loved and married. But there was this other kind of interesting, funny guy, and we did fine. I have a funny, similar story. So mm -hmm. I was trying to make a, a happy 4th of July, just a little video clip for, you know, social media. And so I had <clears throat> mom and I on the camera and I said, you know, happy 4th of July, everybody. And I thought she would mimic me and she didn't. And I said, it's your turn. You say it. And she says, um, people company. And I was like, well, that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, at first I was like, what? And then I'm like, well, that's what 4th of July is about for her. People company. And it's one of my, it, it was the last 4th of July that she was alive. And so mm -hmm. I cherished that goofy little video because she was still there, even though mm -hmm. she couldn't articulate, you know, happy 4th of July, even though that's what I prompted her with. And her response was just so unique and interesting. I just, I just love it. So it's, there are a lot of very interesting moments and there's moments of mm -hmm. joy. It's just, you know, it's not an easy, it's not an easy trip. So no, how, go ahead. No. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. I was just going to respond to that because, you know, when I hear myself say that, I think, well, if I were in the midst of one of the toughest moments and somebody said joy to me, I might want to throw something at them because there are times when it's just not easy. And even acknowledging that to yourself, this is hard. This is unpleasant. This is smelly. This is physically harmful to me allows you, I think, to make better choices and better decisions that you don't have to wait until you've worn yourself to an absolute nub before you reach out for help, before you say, this is too hard for one person to do. And I think a lot of times caregivers, spousal caregivers, family caregivers think they're called on to do it all, to do it to the nth degree. And then by the time they have to reach out for help, it comes from a place of grief and despair, as opposed to a place of intentional, intelligent planning, looking at your resources, looking at what's out there. And I try to coach people how to get to that place in a way that does not feel like it's a betrayal, because it's not a betrayal. It's, it's handling something difficult in a way mm -hmm. that works for you, your partner, and your family. I had decided on memory care for my mom, which we were blessed because she had the means. Mm -hmm. When my dad was in the hospital, my mom got bounced around between my house, my sister's house, and then she'd be in her own home with her younger sister who took care of their mom who had vascular dementia. And 
of course, all the bouncing around and the confusion and the upheaval, you know, that's not good for anybody, no, but it definitely wasn't good for her or her dog. And when she was at my house, my, I had three dogs at the time and my dog hated her dog, hated her poodle with a passion. Like my, my dog would literally sleep 85 pound golden retriever slept wrapped around the office chair, not next to me, not in the same room, but he had to be like practically touching me. I was like, dude, please. I can't, I mean, I've rolled over your ear. I've kicked you in the head. Could you just move six inches to one direction? <laughs> he was a little obsessive and he was never more than three feet away from me. If he could, if he could manage it, he was as close to me as physically possible. That dog came into my house. He would literally go sleep in the dog yard, which was on the North side wow. of the house. So it was shady and damp and not that that affected a golden retriever, but you know, it was just kind of like, that is how much he hated that dog. <laughs> And I recognized that, you know, my husband and I are self-employed. I'm like, this will not last a week. I can't deal with her for two or three days without wanting to, you know, scream or, you know, harm somebody. It's just like, nope, this isn't going to work. And the best thing about memory care for her is she had friends and they got into mischief and I didn't have to worry about it. I mean, I did a little bit when she and one of her friends rolled up her area rug and stuffed it in the corner of her friend's room. I mean, it was very strange mischief. And she wouldn't have had any of that living with me. So right. it, I think, unfortunately, that's not necessarily an option for as many people as it should be. But mm -hmm. I, I get really frustrated when I read, you know, taking care of them is the best honor we could ever do. And I'm like, nobody's been able to tell me why, though. Somebody will say, like, this is more directed at caregivers like myself, you know, Taking care of those who took care of us is the highest honor. Okay, well, I didn't feel that way. So explain to me why you feel that way. Never get a response. They just put that garbage out there, that toxic positivity out there, and then they can't answer why. I'm like, okay, why didn't I not feel that way? Maybe I, maybe I was doing something wrong and I could have shifted my thinking if you'd explained where you were coming from. I just, I don't think they believed it. But what, how, you talk about, planning for the future like you get the diagnosis and you talk about you know first off i think you need to you you do talk about it a little bit but that's when you should start reimagining your relationship but what else do you talk about i believe it's chapter four <laughs> at the beginning like planning <laughs> together how you're going to deal with this disease together because i think i don't know anybody that's actively stated and like i said as we did the intro if this is probably close to the 300th episode, if not over. Mm -hmm. And nobody's ever said, well, you know, my spouse was diagnosed or my parent was diagnosed and we sat down together and planned out X. And obviously that is something we should all be doing. So how do you suggest, you know, you get this devastating diagnosis, you know that it's going to be super ugly later on down the road. How do you not just shut down out of fear and start planning for our future? I think some people do. I think some people do just say, well, I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to do today. And then other people make this hugely expansive promise. I will never put you in a nursing home. Worst kind of mistake to make because exactly. you just don't know. Never make that promise. And yet, what promise can you make? Because you, you want to say something. You can't just go, oh, gee, well, you got Parkinson's. You have to do that. But what you can say is you have Parkinson's. We don't know where this is going. I will be beside you. I will not abandon you to deal with this on your own. And that's a real promise that as long as you can stay healthy and alive, you can keep that promise. And I think because we live in the society where we've seen a million TV episodes that in 29 minutes go from, you know, situation to crisis to imagined recovery to real recovery, the end. We think that, that our lives are going to go that way. Oh, our lives don't go that way. So I think ideally you do several things at the beginning of a Parkinson's diagnosis. I think you have to get the right medical care. And that does not mean a community neurologist. There is a specialist called a movement disorder specialist. There are not enough of them in the country. It's a fairly new specialty, maybe 20 years old or so. And get an appointment right away because it can take six months to get an appointment with a movement disorder specialist because they are so few. Um, contact your 
an, an elder care attorney, which is different than an estate attorney, different than a real estate attorney, because they go across taxes and real estate and investments and, you know, all of the other things that are required, you know, employment law. They know all those specialties as they apply to people who are aging or people who have disabilities or are caring for somebody with disabilities. Those are two moves to make right away. Get that stuff in place and then you can let go of it. That means you've got your powers of attorney and all of those things. But then I think people don't say, well, and, and I don't know exactly what the words are. I've been working on writing out for people caregiving plans. How do you want me to come along with you on this journey? What do you want from me? And I think that's important because I hear from caregivers who, for example, say, well, he won't let me come to the doctor with me. He won't let the doctor talk to me. And yet the unspoken part of that is, but my partner expects me to be there, to make meals, to take care of things, to pick up every struggle that he or she is not having. They expect me to do all of this, but they don't let me talk to the doctor. I don't think that's okay. And I think mm -hmm. that an early conversation when you're not in stress means that you can say, do you want me to help you as things get hard? And get that set. Well, yeah. Okay. Here's what I, as your potential caregiver, need. I'm going to need to talk to your doctors freely. I'm going to need to ask questions, get my questions answered about caregiving. I'm going to need to tell you when something is too hard and we have to find a new way. And to be able to learn to communicate with each other. Now, that's hard if you've had a really rocky marriage, a really rocky relationship. And I don't know any magic answer to that. But I do know that at its best, caregiving has to involve talking about what's needed. You asked me early <clears throat> on. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. go ahead. Well, I definitely don't think my dad did that. Um, mm -hmm. My parents had probably a little bit more of a rocky marriage than not. and. You know, my mom was very independent and she was just going to do what she needed to do despite him. You know, she figured out how to basically work around him, make him think it was his idea kind of thing. And I definitely think that that because he then, as typical for men, husbands of that generation, took over as she needed him to take over. Like he took over the cooking, which was definitely not a good idea because he was a horrible cook. But she couldn't functionally do the steps anymore mm -hmm. so you know maybe if they had discussed it they made it they might have come up with a better solution or they would have at least discussed it and she might not have been as resistant because the more help she needed the more resistant my mom mm -hmm. was and i feel like that kind of conversation when she was still you know mentally good might have you know maybe could have helped at the end when he was gone and, you know, I basically just stepped in as, quote, the best friend and started doing stuff with her and taking her to the dentist and the doctor. And, you know, she complained about him all the time. <laughs> that was hard. She, the days that she's like complaining that he was a, a lazy SOB because she, he wasn't taking her to the dentist. And he, she hoped now he's paying you to do this. Right. I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> and I just had to laugh because. Right. You know, he'd been gone for two years or a year and a half. I'm like, mm -hmm. no, he's not. I have to do this because nobody else around is doing it. <laughs> but I just feel like having that conversation in the beginning gives them to back some control that they're losing. I think that's right. And then you can say, this is what we planned together, Mom. This is what we said we were going to do. And I also think that having that kind of plan allows you to know, you the caregiver, to know there are things that you're not going to be able to do. That there are times that you're going to have to, to say, of course you wish I would do that, but I'm not going to, and I can't. And I use the analogy in the book that if your partner suddenly said, pick up the refrigerator and move it to the other side of the room, you know, you're not going to have any internal conflict about that. No, you're, you're not going to go, oh, dear, well, should I try? What if I, you know, you're going to say, gosh, I guess that would be cool if I could, but I can't. So how else can I help? And once you get to that place, realizing that it doesn't have to be as extreme as picking up the refrigerator, it can be skipping the bridge game you've done every week for the last 20 years. 
you can say, I know you wish I would stay home and skip the bridge game, but it's really important to me to do this and I am going to do it. And here are the plans that I've made to keep you safe until I get back. See, I think that wording, I wish I could do that. How else can I help? Is less, it's not, basically telling them you can't do something, I think gets interpreted as a little bit confrontational or you're not doing what I want. And so Mm -hmm. then turning it around saying, well, I can't do that, but how, what, what other thing could I maybe do is just like, okay, like we should always be doing that with everybody. It doesn't matter if they have a cognitive, <laughs> yeah. di- like there's some really good life advice in the book, even if you don't, aren't dealing with this disease. Yeah, and then um, like what you said, you know, this is important to me and I'm going to do it. And here's why you'll be fine. You're reassuring them without being defensive, which <laughs> probably very difficult. Um, I didn't, I didn't have those issues. I, my biggest issue was I, I spent far too much time visiting. I would go for two to three hours, which guests were always telling me it's too long. You should go for more than one day and less time, more days, which that didn't really work with my schedule. Cause you know, I did have another business to run <laughs> and I tried, but it just, I never could make that work very well. But the one time that I finally started doing <clears throat> an hour, we had the best times and more relaxed. And it was just like, well, I should have listened to her, but it was hard to leave because she didn't remember that I'd been there for two hours or she didn't remember that, you know, that we'd gone to the park and watched children or we did this or we did that. And that's when I finally realized that all these people that have been telling me to do more days for less time (laughs) were right. Excuse me. Sometimes. You know, sometimes we have to learn the hard way. I mean, that's that's just how we are. But something that I think can also help in that situation when a person doesn't remember the things that you've done together is to take photos. I mean, we have the ability now to take plenty, plenty of photos with our, with our phones and to take pictures and to just put up one or two pictures, not 20, because that's just overwhelming. But let's look at what we did yesterday, Mom. And there we are. We went to the park and that's you and me. And even if they say that's not you, that's somebody who looks like you. You could say, ah, isn't that funny? You know, we just have to be okay with the person with dementia where they are. And that relieves us a great deal. And that learning to say, no, I want to add one thing to what I said about that, which is that not only do we say, I can't do that, but we acknowledge that it's sensible that you would want that, right? Mm -hmm. When I say, of course, you wish I could pick up the refrigerator. You take a huge amount of conflict out of it because then they're not struggling with you for you to see why it's sensible to get the refrigerator out of there. (laughs) And when you can say, well, yeah, I can see why you would want to do that. Wish I could. And it changes the feeling of that whole conversation to something where you and your person with dementia are on the same side of this struggle. And when you can get to the point where you and they are together facing the fact that they um, can't remember how to eat or that they can't get to the toilet by themselves, how are we going to handle this and remove the conflict from it? I think it's certainly easier for us as caregivers, and I think it's easier for the person with dementia. Well, when you were saying, when you repeated... um. You know, I could see why you wish I could do that. I could almost hear somebody saying that to a toddler. And I know people get really, really agitated when you compare somebody with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or frontal temporal dementia to a child, but their, um, not their behavior, their, what is that word? The the levels they're at Monday morning. Yeah, they're just. Their cognition, their information processing, their capacity to regulate themselves are similar as to when to, to when they were young. And just telling them, it just, being on their side diffuses everything. And I don't know why I was thinking about toddlers when you said that, but it just, I it's guess it reminded me. kind of situation. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and it's not treating Somebody them very childish. Strong-willed. Well, yeah, I mean, I think the fact is that human beings develop from birth to some peak of functioning. And then as things start to decline, they go back to the way younger, less well-developed human beings function. And is that reminiscent of childhood? Of course it is. 
It doesn't mean that the person is, is a child. It means that the situation is familiar to us. That makes sense. So I know we don't have a ton of time left, but okay. we had originally decided to talk about self-care and aftercare. And we've mm -hmm. kind of touched on a lot of topics that I think make self-care easier. And there's lots of talks about that. So what do you suggest people in my scenario? It's been three years since my mom passed away. What's the difference between self-care <clears throat> and aftercare? It's very well, dry I'm, up I'm... here, even though it's raining. <laughs> You know, that distinction is one that I saw in one of those uncredited memes or whatever they're called on the internet. Somebody said it before me. It's not unique to me, but a lot of times when we talk about self-care, what we're really talking about is waiting until we're worn down to a nub and then doing something to fix that. That's not self-care. That's aftercare, right? Mm -hmm. Self-care is recognizing it's not good for me to go without sleep for five days in a row, so I'm not going to do it. How will I fix it? And doing that before you're worn out and exhausted as opposed to feeling like you have to wait until you're drained before you do anything for yourself. Caregivers deserve caretaking of their own from the very beginning. So, and it's not, you know, bubble baths and massages. Those are nice, and if you can make those happen, that's wonderful. But self-care is more like the moments that take you away from the caregiving situation. I've been recently spending time with my mom, who's 95 and who needs more support and help than she did when, she, when we were all younger. And I discovered something that made me so happy, which was that there were little moments when she was in the bathroom or she was doing something or eating a meal that I would stop and do little pieces of standing workout. I would do five wall push-ups and I would do five, five wall push-ups, five squats and five lunges. And it got to the point where in the time interval, I could do 10 and then I could do 20. And it was like, oh, this is taking care of me to the point that I even looked forward to those moments of caregiving, you know, when you're just kind of standing around and you end up scrolling on your phone or just muttering to yourself. <laughs> what can you do for yourself in that moment? Can you meditate? Can you do a little teeny mini, mini workout? Can you carry a book in your hip pocket and just make sure that you read the next page? Can you pray? Can you, you know, whatever is for you so that you find those places where you can reserve them for yourself and then do that. That creates a different kind of day. It's a day that has stuff for you and stuff for the person you're caring for. And it's stuff for you that's separate from them. Right. I think a lot Not of caregivers, that, yeah, I think a lot of caregivers try to find their joy in their person's joy, which is good. You should do that, but not exclusively. <laughs> not and exclusively. A, and how do you suggest people go about moving towards this, this these little pockets of caregiving for themselves? Because that's, that's something I see people, sometimes I think they take on projects to, <laughs> you know, they feel very passionate about something related to this niche. So they, you know, they go on podcasts and they do Instagram lives and they do a lot of other stuff on top of their job, on top of taking care of their, their person. And that might work for them, but it's also more work. Um, I know one person teaches a fitness class. Um, a lot of, you know, just, there's like a lot of people that do it right, but I think there's a lot of more people that need help on, need permission to do it right. And maybe a little shove in the right direction. So can you give them that little shove? Well, you have, if I'm in charge, you have permission to do something completely selfish. Please do something selfish. It doesn't have to be altruistic. It doesn't have to be raising money for the disorder. It doesn't have to be teaching other people. What do you just want to do for you? And you've got to have that. Because if you're not, I mean, it's a stupid truism, but it's absolutely right. If you're not filling yourself, you have nothing to give. And that way lies resentment and exhaustion and just all sorts of difficulty that you don't need to add to the real world difficulty of the disorder that the person has. I also talk in the book about the idea of going on a date with yourself. And I spend some time really thinking about how do you do that? How do you plan for that? And why is that so important? Because 
you don't have Parkinson's. Chances are it's your partner who has Parkinson's. You don't have Alzheimer's. It's a different person and it's their path and not your path. Your path is, is caregiving, but your path is not exactly the same as theirs. And I don't think that's selfish. I think that's mm -mm. realistic. And I think it makes a much stronger caregiver for the person who needs the caregiver. I agree. I know the, I can, I can hear it and this hasn't even been broadcast yet, but it's so hard to find somebody to be with your person. Right. You know, and it's expensive if you don't have a neighbor or a family member. Um, and so a lot of people feel like it's so much stress to get to that point that's not worth it. And I'm assuming you're going to disagree with that. Well, no, no. I think that's why you start a caregiving plan with minute one. You don't wait until you're worn out, until you're the only one who knows how to do the more complicated things. You don't wait to ask your kids to help until their part, their, you know, your partner is so disabled that you really, 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 really have to get help. Instead, you get people involved when it's simple, when it's easy for them to say yes. When you're going to the grocery, would you pick up a carton of milk for me? That engages them. And I think that the earlier you get people engaged, they become familiar with the person's needs before they're so extreme. If you were dropped into the middle of caregiving without having sort of grown into it, you wouldn't know what to do. And so when you call your kids up and say, come spend a week with dad so that I can go somewhere else, they're going to go, I, have, I can't do that, mom. <laughs> so you start much smaller, much earlier. One of the bits of advice that I give people is to make a list of all the things that need to happen in the household on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis, and a second list of people they know, whether they're local or not. And, and this is the key. What skill do you think they have that can help the most? And I've said this many times. Do not ask me to call banks, insurance companies, because that ain't my thing. Three or four seconds on, or maybe well, a little more, 30 seconds on hold and I'm irritated. My husband is a real estate broker and he worked in banking for 20 years. Oh, that man dances to weird hold music. So <laughs> it, ha it has no I effect on him. It has no effect on him whatsoever. He actually doesn't, but I think he could if it was his personality. And so... If you ask somebody like me, hey, can you, you know, set up the online banking to deal with the bank? The answer is going to be, uh, I'd love to help, but no, because that's just not my thing. But if you want me to run to the grocery store, you know, make some meals that you can throw in the slow cooker or bake some bread or some cookies, well, I'm your girl. You know, you want me to research some things? I can do that too. And so when you have that list of people and what you think their strong suit is, when somebody says, oh, man, Terry, I'm so sorry to hear about Peter. Is there anything I can do to help? Boom. You've got you an, answer. an answer. And you're I not have saying... a little handout. Oh, you do? I, I do. I have a handout that it's available on my website that is um, about just that, about how people can ask for the help that they need. And, and it's also intended for like the, the secondary caregivers, how you can actually offer help. What kind of help can you offer? And it is like that. I'm stopping at the grocery store. Do you need anything at the post office? And those are easy entries in. There's so, so much to say about caregiving and about the care for the caregiver. And um, I want to show you the cover of my book, just in case people haven't heard about it before. Love, Dignity, and Parkinson's, From Care Partner to Caregiver. And I wrote it because it was the book I needed. I can relate to that. I, I started a podcast because I couldn't find the answers I wanted. So I found the people who had the answers. <laughs> and three years later, I'm still exactly. learning things that I wish I'd known, you know, five, ten years earlier with my yeah. mom. Because it would have made things better for both of us. And maybe even extended family that, you know, did the best they could. But, you mm -hmm. know, we've had three generations. My paternal, no, not paternal, maternal great-grandmother, my maternal grandmother, my mom. So I will break the cycle. I'm going to live to be 103 like my paternal grandmother. She was mostly fine until about the last year of her life. And then she started having little mini strokes. But she did not have any cognitive disabilities whatsoever. She was just mostly blind from glaucoma. And then she was really hard of hearing, which I think that's almost Those as bad. Tough. Yeah. Those are tough. It was hard to have conversations with her because you had to literally scream in her ear and we would sit outside and it's like, I really don't need the neighbors to hear all of it. 
why are you screaming at grandma? Yeah, it's like, um, I really didn't, you know, sometimes she would ask questions that I recognized were end of life type. I want to make sure you're in the right mm -hmm. place before I go kind of questions. And it's like, um, I really don't want to give you the truthful answer, but I certainly don't want to scream any answer that the neighbors are going to hear. <laughs> it's It's been a journey with, you know, the, our aging population. And like I said, I've learned a lot. I learned a lot from your book. So even though it's it's geared towards families dealing with Parkinson's disease, those of us in the Alzheimer's dementia world know that there's plenty of overlap, for better or worse. So I strongly suggest you read her book because it has lots of great advice that you may not have heard somewhere else before. And then you also have some programs that you're pushing again. Um, if you give us the website, I'll make sure that it's linked in the show notes so that everybody can find all that good stuff easily. Thank you. Yes, I've got some other programs, all of which are intended to take care of caregivers. And if you go to my website, which is seaberryhouse.com, which is the name of my publisher, seaberryhouse.com, and click on resources, you'll see the ones that are there. And that's where new, uh, new resources will show up. Uh, the 21-day online program and the, the handouts that I've mentioned as well as some other free things that people can download, a meditation for caregivers that people can get for free as well. Sounds like excellent resource. I appreciate the book and you coming on the show today and helping everybody that's dealing with an aging population because we all need to, we all need to learn these things, whether we have a loved one afflicted with a disorder or not, because then we can help other people who might be. Mm -hmm. And this has been fantastic. And like I said, Terry's information is excellent and you're going to want to check it out. So thank you once again for joining me and I will talk to you guys all again next week. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.